Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. We all know that self-discipline is a necessary trait if we want to achieve our goals and be successful. But what can you do? What are some tactics that you can do to actually instill self-discipline within yourself? And besides that, besides the self-discipline part, there's another aspect to being successful in achieving our goals that we have for ourselves. It's managing our time in an effective manner so that we get the most out of it. And the problem is in our modern world, we have so many things vying for our attention. First, we have the internet on our smartphones, on our desktops that are just, there's so many things there that can just distract us from work, from our family. But then you have work, then you have family, then you have commitments to church or maybe a community organization that are all competing for your, your attention and for your time. How do we manage all these things in a way that we get the most bang for our buck and actually helps us lead a life of significance? Well, our guest today has written two books on these topics. Uh, they're really fantastic. His name is Rory Vaden, and he's the author of Take the Stairs, and the other one is Procrastinating on Purpose. Rory started out his career as a salesman, and now he is a consultant and coach for salesmen, and as well as organizations that are sales-focused. His job is to help people be more effective salespeople. Anyways, the principles that he teaches to his clients are applicable to any person who is trying to do the best they can in this life. That's why I wanted to have him on the show. Anyways, today on the podcast, Rory and I discuss self-discipline, having this sort of take the stairs mentality towards life. We're not going to take the escalator. And then we're going to talk about how we can procrastinate on purpose and what that means to better manage our time. So I think you're really going to like this podcast. A lot of great practical takeaways that you can use right away after you're done listening. So without further ado, let's talk to Mr. Rory Vaden. Rory Vaden, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brett. It's good to be here. All right. So you're a business consultant, successful salesman, um, and you've also written books uh, about productivity, motivation, how to just live a more full life. And your first book, I love the title of it because it really encapsulates sort of the philosophy that I take towards life. It's called Take the Stairs, and it's about self-discipline. And uh, mm-hmm. you make the common case argument, the common sense argument that you know, if you want to be successful in life, you just have to keep doing the things that will bring you success, even if you don't feel like it. And I think most people, like they, they get this, like they, they know that on an like intellectual level, um, but we have such a hard time putting it into practice. Why is that? Well, you know, it's, there's lots of reasons why, but one reason is actually rooted in neuroscience um you know our our brain we we you know the dopamine drug that is inside of our brain we get these little hits of dopamine whenever we do something in the short term right like it feels good um and so what feels good in the short term is is something that we are kind of drawn to biologically but the thing is our biology was never prepared never prepared us for success it prepared us for survival and so when you understand that it's like breaking breaking free of that um and working the brain is kind of divided into these three parts, but the the front part of your your brain, the frontal lobes, is kind of referred to as the human brain. That's kind of the one for logic and thinking um, and rationale, and that is the one that has to be consciously developed. And like the paradox principle in Take the Stairs is easy short-term choices lead to difficult long-term consequences. Meanwhile, difficult short-term choices lead to easy long-term consequences. So it's this this great paradox that only a few people understand, but ultra performers have realized that procrastination and indulgence are like these creditors that charge us interest. They make us feel good now, it's easy in the short term, but it's what creates the more difficult life. So contrary to what people think, take the stairs is not about making life as hard as possible. It's the exact opposite. It's about making life as easy as possible, but it's based on sort of the unpopular premise that creating the easy life comes from doing the hardest parts of things as soon as possible. So it requires you to like play the long game. Exactly. Why is that? I mean, that, that's hard to do though. Like, right. Like, I mean, like, there's been all these studies that, you know, people know they need to save for retirement, right? Cause like retirement's going to come, but then they don't save. Um, is it just because like the future is so amorphous and not concrete that it makes it hard to like play the long game? 
I absolutely think so. I, I think, you know, like one, a lot of times when people come to us and they say, hey, I really struggle with self-discipline in this area or that area, what we almost always find is it's not that they struggle as much from a lack of discipline as they do from a lack of vision. Um, our, the amount of our endurance is directly proportionate to the clarity of our vision. So if we have a crystal clear picture of what we want in the long run, then that creates a naturally strong connection to to how the sacrifices we're asking ourselves to make today forward us towards a future that we care about, which thereby creates this context for action to take place, and our discipline engages almost automatically. But if we don't have that clear vision, or if we don't spend much time thinking about it, which most people don't, most people suck at vision. Um, and we were, we were taught as kids, you know, not to be dreamers, like, you know, get your head out of the clouds and uh, think realistic and focus on what's in front of you. And yet the most successful people in the world, at least in the business realm and, and in the athletic realm and, and really, I mean, the entertainment realm too, they have such a clear vision and they spend so much time thinking about it. They see it so vividly in their mind that it's like the vision pulls them through all the crap they got to go to to get there. Whereas absent that long-term vision, you're simply governed by your emotional impulses of what feels good right now because you're biologically, like, you're set up that way. Gotcha. So, I mean, yeah, there's that verse in the Bible, I think it's Proverbs, right, where there's no vision that people perish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so how do you make that? I mean, how do you create that vision? Is it just a matter of sitting down, journaling, writing, thinking about it, talking about it with your with a mastermind group or your friends or your, your wife? I mean, what do you, how do you fashion that vision? Well, you know, we we recently did like a little blog mini series on these uh, seven realizations of rich people, and one of the most common characteristics that we found with wealthy people is that they fall asleep every night thinking in very vivid detail about what they want in the future. And that is something that I started doing a couple of years ago, and it's made a huge difference because the the more you can see it, the more likely you are to work towards it. Now, some people call it the law of attraction as kind of this cosmic force. And, you know, maybe part of it is that, but I kind of tend to believe it's it's less of that. And it's more just about you're creating this context by which making sacrifices makes sense. And you start paying, you're paying attention and you're open-minded to things that you would not have been open-minded to in the absence of that vision. But um, from a from a tactical standpoint, a little technique that we we do, and um, we take all our coaching clients through this. So we, we do sales coaching. That's really our core business is, so we work a lot with salespeople. But we have them go through this exercise called VAST, um, V-A-S-T. And one of the things, again, coming down to neuroscience is understanding that the brain thinks in pictures and things that are more vividly experienced in our mind are more likely to become true in reality. So when I say ice cream cone, most people see an image of an ice cream cone. They don't see the letters I-C-E-C-R-E-A-M. Well, when we think of vision, a lot of us talk about vision abstract, and companies are some of the worst at this. You say, our vision is to be the best in the world at whatever. Well, that's a kind of a crappy vision from an inspiring perspective, from a motivational perspective, because what, what is more motivating is a picture, is to say, you know, imagine our uh, a picture of our company headquarters inside of whatever Forbes magazine being written up for the 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 most uh, enriching customer experience of all companies in the world. And there's case the features on us, um, and everywhere you go, people recognize the logo on your business card and they ask you about it. That becomes more alive. So so V A S T the V stands for visual. The A stands for auditory, um, the S stands for smell, and the um, the T oh sorry um, the T stands for touch. So when you think of your vision, don't think of it in some obscure term like I want to do this amazing thing. Um, think about in your mind what can you see, what can you hear in that moment that it came true, what can you smell, and what can you touch. And your when you think that vivid that. In, in as much vivid detail, your mind really can't differentiate between what is real and 
what is not real. I mean, it's it's why nightmares wake us up because they feel so real because your your mind doesn't really dictate and you have these emotional responses uh, based on it. So that's a couple ideas about how to how to do it. And I think it really is important to get that basic because most of us just don't do it. But the bigger thing is be willing to do it and spend time thinking about it. Awesome. So we've talked sort of like big picture, playing the long game, but we gotta we have to deal with the day to day and. I know what gets a lot of people down is they know what the stuff they need to do to be successful, but it just feels like a grind. And it's just like, they mm. just, they don't want to do it. They can't get up. It's another Monday. They have to do these reports. They have to you know make the call. They have to, whatever it is. Um, how do you, you make the case that you should fall in love with the daily grind. Mm. How can you do that? When <laughs> You feel like your job, it's just, it's, it's, it's mind numbing. Yeah, so this is it's uh, that's actually something that one of our very first coaching clients his name is Chad Goldwasser and he was the number one Keller Williams real estate agent in the world out of like 76,000 uh they have many more agents than that now even but um and he said that that was one of his philosophies was falling in love with the daily grind but it, it ties in well to one of our principles that we embrace at Southwestern um which is a lot of times people let's say they retake the stairs and they come up and they say, okay, Rory, so let's say I start doing all the things you're talking about, right? Like, I, let's say I do start taking the stairs and metaphorically speaking, I'm doing the things I know I should be doing. I'm doing the things that I are making the sacrifices. I'm paying the price. And how long do I have to do that for? And the truth is that we never get to stop doing them. We never do. Um, now, that doesn't mean life is going to be miserable. It doesn't mean that life is going to be one great big giant trip to the gym or that you're only going to eat foliage for the rest of your life. But uh, it does mean learning to embrace this concept that we call the rent axiom. And the rent axiom says that success is never owned. Success is only rented. And the rent is due every day. Success is never owned, success is rented, and the rent is due every day. And at, at first, sometimes that strikes people as bad news because it's like, oh, no. But in, it's really the most empowering truth of all of the Take the Stairs principles because when you embrace this idea that I'm not going on a diet, I'm not going on a 90-day workout program, you embrace the idea that these changes and these choices that I'm making in my life are not temporary ones but permanent ones. Then what happens is you stop wasting time looking for the shortcut. You stop believing in this fantasy land that you're going to somehow win the lottery or have, discover a magic pill or come up with some business idea that just goes viral, and you let go of all that junk, and you just get focused on doing the things that you know you should be doing. And what happens, it's, it's, again, it's such a crazy paradox because it seems like this take the stairs, all of this stuff we're talking about seems like it would be so hard. But what really happens is it's as hard today as it will ever be. And every day moving forward, it gets easier versus the other way around. It always just keeps getting harder and harder because you keep making these indulgent choices. And like I said before, ultra performers realize that procrastination and indulgence are nothing more than creditors that charge us interest. Meanwhile, ultra performers realize they always, you, you're always going to pay a price. And that's the thing that we have to come to grips with. We always pay a price. We either pay the price now, today, or we will pay it later with interest. But most of us are trying to go through life trying to circumvent paying the price. We're trying to be successful without putting in the work. We want to believe in all the, the daydreams of the overnight success or the, the online you know viral explosion and millions just coming in. And it's just not true. I mean, when you sit down with any ultra performer, which is the top 1% of their industry, that's how we would uh, categorize that. It's always the story of discipline. It's always the story of doing the things they know they should be doing even when they don't feel like doing them. It's not about taking the escalator. It's about taking the stairs. We're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. So one of the things I found that men overly complicate, and that doesn't have to be hard at all, is style, clothing. A lot of guys think they need it, just like this giant giant wardrobe to dress well. And the fact is, you just need to 
few solid pieces of clothing, you can have a very versatile wardrobe. And one of the most versatile pieces of clothing you can have in your wardrobe is a pair of dark denim jeans. You can wear the t-shirt, sport coat, whatever, office casual, nice dinner date. It, it can go with anything as long as you do it right. But the problem with dark denim is that you can spend a hefty amount, like over $200 for a good quality pair. That's why I love Mott & Bow. You get a, a pair of premium handcrafted denim for less than 100 bucks. And one of the things I love about Mott & Bow is their design. They have a less is more mentality. None of these weird, like, et, you know, stitchings on the back and weird flares or pre-faded stuff. It's just plain, simple, dark denim which is fantastic. Also another feature of Mott & Bow, they have a feature if you know if you don't know what size, you're kind of in between size, you don't know if you're a 33 or 34, with Mott & Bow you can get both for free, try on both of them, keep the one that fits you the best, send the other one back for free, no charge on you, and it's awesome. So if you'd like to try out Mott & Bow, go to mottandbow.com slash artofman and you'll automatically get 20% off your purchase. Again, that's mottandbow.com slash artofman for 20% off. And on the topic of clothing, we all know shopping for clothes can be a nightmare. I mean, you'll, you'll go to one store to find a shirt, and then you'll have to go to another store to find a pair of pants, and then another shirt to go another store to find a, a tie. It's just a hassle. That's what's great about jackthreads.com. They take the hassle out of, out of shopping. It's a one-stop shopping experience. Jack Threads features curated selections of brands you've heard of, brands you'll want to hear about, and exclusive collaborations you can't find anywhere else. And what's cool about Jack Threads, they have a nice mixture of styles of clothing. They have stuff more conservative, uh, more traditional. That's kind of my thing when I've, I've found some great stuff there. They also have things for guys who are a little more fashion forward, more younger, fresh, hip, cool look to it. So they have that, that sort of stuff there as well. And it's a great value. You'll get the most bang for your buck on things you love and need. So anyways, if you'd like to try out Jack Threads and get a discount in the process, got an exclusive discount for you guys, get an additional 20% off by visiting jackthreads.com slash artofman and entering coupon code artofman at checkout. And this discounts on top of the already great prices you're going to get. Again, jackthreads.com slash artofman and enter coupon code artofman at checkout. Jack Threads, elevated style every day. So this is interesting. It brings up an interesting point. So there's a lot of talk you know, on the internet, for example, right? You see all these memes, motivational things about you know following your passion and being passionate, and like you got to be passionate about your work. But in my experience, it doesn't seem like like I can get passionate about something, but then I don't do the work. Mm. Um, but then like I'll start working on something, even if I don't feel like it, and then. And 30, 45 minutes later, I'm like, I'm pretty excited about what I'm working on. So does does passion come before work or is work or is passion sort of the result of just doing good work? Well, I'm glad that you asked this, Brett. And nobody has ever asked me this question, um, uh, not in a public interview. And I, I really do love the question because I see the same thing as you. And there is a it's kind of a, a natural symbiotic relationship in some ways between passion and work. It can be, but I agree with you that the memes that are out there are very, they're very underserving to people because, and, and, and look, as we talk about the art of manliness, right? We talk about what does it mean to be a man? To me, being a man means you do what you have to do until you earn the right to do what you want to do. You do what you have to do until you earn the right to do what you want to do. And it's like, if you have kids or if you're starting a business or if you're married, like if you have, ob if you have any sort of responsibility or obligation in your life, like you need to let that passion crap go. I mean, you, you, you have other things that matter and those, I mean, being a man means you're, you're the protector, you're the provider, your passion is secondary. Now that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be passionate. And I do believe in the statement, if you love what you do, uh, it will feel less like you ever have to work a day in your life. Um, but I think most people who complain about not being passionate, the reason they're not passionate is because they're mediocre at what they're doing. And so this is a litmus test that we use. Um, we, we, we basically uh, call it the crush it test uh, for how to know when you should sort of change jobs 
oh, and move on. And so people say, well, you know, I'm thinking about quitting my job and I want to just go start this business and, you know, I want to be online or I want to, uh, you know, do a, do a side business or whatever. And I, it's great. I'm all about that stuff. I, we love entrepreneurs. We love side businesses. I mean, we teach people how to do that. And we also love employees. And it's, it's not about the business. It's about you. And so the question I always ask people in the litmus test is, have you crushed it where you're at? Have you, are you excellent at what you're doing? Because if you have not laid it all on the line and you have not been fully committed and you've not done everything in your power to be successful, then you don't really know what your current opportunity affords you because you're being mediocre. So your first step needs to cr be to crush it where you're at. Otherwise, you're just going to bounce from passionate uh, pursue, you know, passionate idea to passionate idea. You're just like this, you know, blowing in the wind. And the reality is nothing ever makes you passionate because you didn't put in the work to be successful. So crush it where you're at, get to the top. Um, it, cause it's like, you know, when you're climbing a mountain, the view at the top looks and feels a whole lot different than the view when you're climbing up the side of the mountain. So climb to the top of the mountain and then decide is this really giving me what I want? But most people who use that passion argument, it's because they're mediocre at what they're doing. And then they're kind of, they're giving themselves the payoff of saying, well, it's just not my passion. And I think that's, I think that's weak. Okay. So uh, you, let's say you, you, people realize what they need to do. They got their vision. They know the things they, they have to do, but there's still something that's keeping them from just committing to it. And like, getting going on it. So you have this, what you call the buy-in principle. Mm. Um, what are some things can people can do to buy into their commitment they want to make to be a better person? Yeah. So the buy-in principle simply stated is this, that the more we have invested into something, the less likely we are to let it fail. The more we have invested into something, the less likely we are to let it fail. Um, and it's easy to understand that intellectually, but it's very hard to live by that pragmatically. So when, because what the buy-in principle suggests is that if we make a commitment to do something and then it becomes difficult to follow through, that we should actually increase our investment. We should spend more time, more money, more prayer, more effort, more focus, more resources on whatever that commitment is. Well, in the escalator world that we live in, it's almost the exact opposite of that. Most of us keep our commitments conditionally. We keep them as long as they're convenient to do so, but the moment it becomes inconvenient to keep that commitment, we typically start questioning that commitment and we start convincing ourselves that maybe it's because I'm just I, there's a, another passion I should be pursuing. And that is um, you know really, really dangerous because we start, we start thinking that success is a matter of our circumstances and really success is a matter of our choices. And that's why you have some people who go from average performance to average performance and to average, and they're constantly changing jobs and careers. Um, and and it's, it's because it's a mental thing. So in terms of how do you, how do you overcome that? Well, there's a very practical um, sort of strategy, which is you increase your, your level of commitment and thereby the likelihood of your success by intentionally creating the question how so that you don't accidentally relent to the question should. M most people, we, when, when it becomes challenging to follow through on a commitment, we, we say, you know what? Maybe this isn't the right time. Maybe this isn't, you know, the right place. Or, you know, should I do this now? Should I do it later? Should I give it to somebody else? Uh, and their whole life becomes about that question, should. Should, 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 should. And if you're not careful, Brett, you become what I like to call a should head. Uh, and so you, you, you got to be aware of should. Well, the ultra performers, it's not that they know all the answers, but they ask themselves the right question and they they shift. This is what we call the pivot point. The pivot point is when you think you're shifting from should I do this or can I pull this off or is it possible to simply asking the question, how can I pull this off? How can I hit that target? How can I meet that deadline? How can I lose that weight? How can I start that business? How can I get out of debt? How can I save this marriage? How? 
Gotcha. You know, here's another thing that I've done, and I love that. And instead of asking should, asking how, and like trying to find a solution right. uh, to your problem. But another thing I've done, I've applied the buy-in principle in my own life. I've actually like made bets uh, mm. with people. So there's like a website called Stick. I think it's S-T-I-K-K. And you can actually put money on the line for like goals you want to accomplish. No so, way. That's cool. So in, what it's, what's ingenious about it is you have, you set up an accountability partner and then you can, if you don't fulfill your goal, uh, you lose your money and, oh, man. You, can, and, and you can make it even like more, uh, make it hurt more by having the money go to some organization that is against your values. Right. So if you are a diehard Republican, you can have the money go to the democratic national committee or if you're um pro abortion you have to go to anti-abortion so it's kind of crazy and i i've done that in my a few times when i've had like these big projects where i i haven't wanted i I just wasn't committed to it just didn't wasn't bought into it i put money on the line and once i've had that money on the line it's like it hurt like knowing that i was going to lose that money like Mm -hmm. no no matter what i was going to get it done get that thing done. So that was another thing I've done in my own life to sort of... I love that. I mean, that's great. That's a great example. The more you have invested into something, you know, and there it's not just money, but it's also that emotional pain. <laughs> that's the worst. Yeah. One of our uh, one of our coaching clients, we just they just sent this out on the email. Um, she is an, a, I think, I think uh, she's a huge Auburn fan. So she lives in Alabama and she's a diehard Auburn fan. Well, she set up a referral contest, her and her coach. And if she didn't get a certain number of referrals, she has to wear Alabama, uh, clothing gear and talk about how much she loves Alabama for like a week. And so that's just those little kind of, um, consequences, those, those play a big factor. And, and coming back to the earlier question, you asked like your story there about using stick. I think Brett is a, it makes the future more real. It, and so that, that, that helps with that long-term perspective. So a principle you talk about in your book, take the stairs, which resonated with me. And I think it's important for particularly younger people to understand and comprehend is this idea called the harvest principle. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's, what is the harvest principle? Can you explain that for our listeners? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things we have done is really studied, um, time management and we've really challenged and we've gone out to ultra performers and, and we've taken this list of cliches you hear about time management and just said, Hey, do you buy in? Like, do you believe in this? Is this a, do you actually believe this, this, this statement? Like do you operate your life or your business by it? And we have found that <laughs> emphatically, almost always they do not. And very often it's the opposite. In fact, that's what the new Procrastinating on Purpose book, that's why we wrote it, was to sort of dispel all of these myths about productivity. And one of them, I mean, one of the most common things you hear is people talk about work-life balance. Well, so we go out and we ask these these ultra performers, we now call them multipliers. That's the term we use in the in the the, the new book, which is a subtitle is uh, by permissions to multiply your time. Um but anyways, the they they kind of they said balance is basically a complete joke that they have never embraced that idea of work life balance because and if you think about it now that I've asked them and kind of we've gone through these interview processes, balance is really a horrible metaphor for how to spend your time because the word balance by definition means equal force in opposite directions. So it sort of implies the idea that being balanced in our time would be spending equal time on different things. The part that's crazy about that is that if you sleep something like eight hours a day and you work something like eight hours a day, then to be the only way you could be balanced would be to do one other task and you'd have to do that other task eight hours every single day, which is ludicrous. It doesn't even make sense. Um, And you know, multipliers have realized also that success is not related to the amount of time that you spend doing something. It's not related to the volume of tasks that you complete. Success is simply related to the significance of those tasks and what, uh, and, and namely the results that are achieved. And you can, you can achieve results in certain areas of your life with less time. Working out is probably the best example. You don't have to work out eight hours every day to be in great health. If you work out 30 minutes every single day, you're going to find that it's going to, for most people, that's going to make a massive change. And so what ultra performers do 
is they actually said it was the opposite. They said rather than trying to create balance, they they intentionally create imbalance. They imbalance their life for a short predefined season, uh, which we ha- we refer to as a harvest season because it reflects m- much more the attitude of like a f- a farmer during harvest. The, f- the farmer during harvest, you know, they work. 16, 18 hours a day because the, the harvest is when the harvest is and they have to harvest their crop and that's going to sur- make them survive the rest of the year. And that is much more reflective of how life works. It works in these seasons. And so the idea is to imbalance your life for a short predefined season and leverage the power of focus and intensity to create a desired result. And then once you've create once you've created that result, it's much easier to sustain that result over time with less effort. And, and you know, just a kind of a personal story for me, I used to be 45 pounds heavier than I am right now. And a lot of people don't know that. And when I first started on this whole journey of, of self-discipline, I made this resolution that I was going to stop uh, drinking alcohol forever, that I was going to stop eating dessert forever. I was going to work out every single day forever until I got to my desired goal, my desired weight. And I hit that, you know, eight months after I started, I lost 45 pounds. And ever since then, it's like, yeah, I have, I have a couple drinks. I have dessert a couple nights a week. Um, and I don't have to work out every single day. Uh, I work out a, a few times a week or I work out just, a, you know, a little bit every day. And, and it's a lot easier to maintain it. So I'm not in a harvest season that relates to my physical stuff right now because I already went through that and I'm just maintaining. Now I'm imbalancing towards other things. Awesome. Yeah, I love that idea of like seasons in your life because I get a lot of letters from readers. They're young guys in their 20s and they just feel like they're frustrated because things aren't happening for them, mm-hmm. right? And they're like, they don't have the success that they they think they should have by now. And usually it means like they want house or they want, you know, you know, the, the typical trappings of success. And I always have to tell them like, man, that's going to, that's going to take a while. Like you're, yeah. you're in a different stage in your life where you have to focus on different things and sort of create a foundation so you can get to those, those things. You can't have it now. And, uh, yeah, I just, th- I think that Amen. analogy of seasons to your life, uh, is really helpful in helping you think about the long game. Right. And then when you move in, when you get married and you have kids, like you're going to move into a different season. Like right now, you know, you're not going to have as much fun as you did when you were in your early 20s and single and footloose and fancy free. And that's okay. Right. That's just you're in a new season. You approach it that way. And then the kids will eventually move out and you'll have more time to yourself again. But uh, the seasonal approach is really nice. Yeah, well, thank thank you. I mean, amen. I, I'm 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 glad that it resonates because, and and you know, really, I mean, sometimes I think people say that they go, well, you know, it's just not going to be fun. Well, that's not that's not the reality. The reality is when you do this right and you embrace these philosophies, it's just your idea of fun changes. Um, and what what used to be fun was getting bottle service at the club, and then it was you know having a nice car. Uh, and then it, at some point it might become fun is being able to spend time with your kids in the middle of the day and, and having the freedom to be able to do that because you work so hard. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I worked so hard. And the reason why was because I wanted to work then because I said, you know what, one day I'm going to have kids. And when I have kids, I don't want work to be the driving force in my life. Um, so I wanted, I was working harder now because of to, to, to create an opportunity that was going to happen in the future. Again, a lot of this ties back to that sort of longer term thinking. Okay. So your, uh, your second book, um, was, is called procrastinate on purpose. And you say in the beginning of this book that uh, <laughs> it's actually this, you should have wrote, written this book first, sort of the prequel to take the stairs. Why, why is that? Yeah. You know, uh, honestly, Brett, I didn't even realize that it was the prequel until, I was, we, you know, we had done all the research and I was writing and I'm at the very end of the book and it dawns on me that this is the prequel because what Take the Stairs is about, Take the Stairs is all about the psychology of overcoming procrastination, how, you know, increasing your self-discipline and how to do the things you know you should be doing even when you don't feel like doing them. What Procrastinate on Purpose is about 
is what to do with everything else so that you can get down to that. In other words, how do you know what the thing is that only you can do that you must do and it must be done now even if you don't feel like it? And that is what the focus funnel, which is kind of the core framework of POP, Procrastinate on Purpose. Um, So the POP book is really um, what to do with everything else so that you can... you know, boil it down to figure out the thing that only you can do. Gotcha. So, I mean, I, I think you've already hit on this a little bit, but you know, you start off the book talking about the way most people approach time management just doesn't work. And I guess the, mo- the way most people try to approach time management is balance for starters, right? Like I'm going to have eight hours of this. I'm going to do eight hours of family time, eight hours of work. Um, but then you also say that a common way that people try to manage their time is prioritization Mm -hmm. Um, that it doesn't really work though why is that yeah so we talk about the 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 history of time management theory and how as a body of work it developed in the 50s and 60s and it was really originally it was sort of one-dimensional it was all about efficiency it was managing your time by trying to do things faster which made sense because that was sort of the the paradigm of the day was on the heels of manufacturing era and you know cars a model t ford and all that sort of stuff um and then in the late 80s prioritizing your time emerged as the new paradigm. And I th- I give a lot of credit to the late, great Dr. Stephen Covey because he created, you know, he, he popularized this thing called the time management matrix where the y-axis is importance and the x-axis is urgency. And what Dr. Covey did was he gave us, for the first time ever, like a scoring system and, and taught us that not all tasks are created equal. Um and based on these two calculations, importance and urgency, you could you could basically weight certain tasks to be more important, and then you prioritize those tasks, right? Well, for the last 25 years, we've thrown around that word prioritizing your time like it's the end-all, be-all to time management theory. And there's nothing wrong with prioritizing. I mean, prioritizing is a valuable skill, but there is a massive limitation to prioritizing that nobody ever talks about. And that is, there is nothing about prioritizing that creates more time. All prioritizing does is take item number seven on your to-do list and it bumps it up to number one. But there's nothing inherently about that that creates more time. It also does nothing to help you accomplish the other items that are still remaining on your to-do list. So it's a valuable skill to be able to focus first on what matters most, but it doesn't create more time. And so it's more like borrowing time. Prioritizing is like borrowing. It's I'm borrowing time from one activity to spend on another, rightfully so, but it still doesn't help me with the remaining items. And so when you're operating in those two paradigms, it's like the only option you have is to run faster, be more efficient, right? So it's like we can work longer hours or we can move faster during the day or to try to juggle more things. And you're constantly juggling a hundred different balls in the air. And so And that really describes, I think, how most of our coaching clients initially feel about their schedule when we're working with them. It's like, and and we have met some of the most efficient people on the planet. We've met some of the best prioritizers on the planet. But really, it's like all, all we are is a bunch of insanely fast juggling hamsters sprinting towards this inevitable crash landing because you can only do things so fast, which is very well evidenced by the fact that we all carry around miniature computers in our pocket. We're working longer hours than ever before. We have more technology, uh, and yet we're still never caught up. And we have more calendars and checklists to help us prioritize, and and none of that seems to help. We're falling further and further behind. And so that's the limitiza- that's the, lim- the limit uh, limitation of prioritizing, and that was the problem we really wanted to solve with POP. So... You add in another line into that matrix, and it's significance. Is, I guess, significance a way of figuring out, like playing the long game? Is it, is it putting your your actions in a, in a perspective of a longer frame of time instead of just the here and now? Yeah, it, basic, it basically is, Brett. That's pretty accurate. I, I think... If, uh, you know, coming back to that matrix, if the y-axis is importance, which is how much does something matter... And the x-axis is urgency, which is how soon does something matter, then significance becomes the z-axis. 
And that is how long is this going to matter? And the significance calculation changes everything because it takes that two-dimensional model and it makes it into three-dimensional. Um, it takes a square and makes it into a cube. And we have said that's the, that is now era three thinking is using the significance calculation to multiply your time. And the big distinction here is, look, let's say absent the significance calculation, we inadvertently overweight the urgency calculation, meaning that well, here's a myth. Here's a here's a myth of time management. People say there's nothing you can do to create more time. Time is the one thing that you can never you know get more of. Well, it is true inside of the the, the paradigm and the construct of one day that you cannot create more time. We all have the same 24 hours, 1,440 minutes, 86,400 seconds. But that's exactly the problem. Most people only think inside of the paradigm of one day. And when you are only thinking on, in the terms of one day, you immediately always go to urgency. You're, you're sucked into putting out fires, dealing with whatever is latest and loudest, and you feel pressured to work longer hours and constantly cram everything in because you only have this one day. Well, when you make the significance calculation, it changes everything. Because when you start thinking not just about today, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day, you start to realize that there are some things that you can do today that make tomorrow better. You can do things now that make tomorrow easier. You can do things, you can set things up in a certain way today that will give you more time uh, in the future. And so that brings us to the premise of the second book. Um, and so in one sentence, and if you've, if you've been sleeping, wake up. Like, you don't want to miss this part. Uh, this is with the whole, the whole concept is built around this one sentence. And that is the way that you multiply time is by giving yourself the emotional permission to spend time on things today that create more time tomorrow. I love that. But... How do you do that? So is that, is that what the, the, the funnel is about, is helping you weed out the stuff that, that you want to evoke, that weed out the stuff that, that won't be significant in the long run? Is that what the, the five permissions are about? Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, it, you know, the significance calculation, the concept of multiplying time, that's kind of the, the, the philosophical part of the pop discussion. The practical part really happens with the focus funnel. So, the focus funnel was our attempt to codify the thought process that ultra performers go through whenever they are making a decision about how to spend their time and what to spend it on and what not to. And so if you picture a funnel at, at the top part, the wide entry point, if you have all of your tasks and emails and meetings and all that stuff coming in the focus funnel, then the top part of the funnel is eliminate. It's the permission to ignore. And we can go through more these in more detail if you want, but, um, if you can't eliminate it, then that task drops down to the middle of the funnel, which is automate. That's the permission to invest. If you can't automate that task, then it drops down to the bottom of the funnel, which is the delegate section. And you say, that's the permission of imperfect. And you say, can this be done by someone else? Now, if you can't eliminate, automate, or delegate the task, then that task falls out the bottom of the focus funnel. At that point, there is one key remaining question, and that question is, must this task be done now, or can it wait until later? If the task must be done now, then that's concentrate. It's the permission to protect. It's all about you know protecting your focus, eliminating distractions, uh, doing the things you know you should be doing. That is kind of where the pop book ends and the take the stairs book picks up. But if the answer to the question uh, can this wait until later is yes, then that is where we're inviting you and encouraging you and challenging you to not eliminate, automate, delegate, or concentrate, but to procrastinate on purpose. Procrastinate on purpose. We call it POP. That's where the title of the book comes from. Now, when you procrastinate on an activity on purpose, you're not going to procrastinate on it forever. But what you're going to do is pop that activity back to the top of the focus funnel, at which point it's going to enter into this holding pattern where it sort of cycles through the focus funnel. And then what happens is 
ultimately or eventually one of the other four strategies, eliminate, automate, delegate, or concentrate, will be executed upon that task. Because either if, if the answer to the question, can this wait till later, is always yes, you eventually develop the confidence to do what you should have done in the first place, which was eliminate it. Oh, or you figure out a way to automate it, or someone rises to the call of leadership and ends up getting delegated, or you end up having to do it because the answer to can this wait till later shifts from yes, it can to no, it can't, and then you must do it now. You know it's your next most significant priority. Where do you think, or what permission do you think most people have trouble with? Like, where do things get stuck? Is it the eliminate or the delegate? Which one is it? Wow, it's all of them. <laughs> it is, it's all of them, and it's different for every person. And that's, I think, um, one thing that's great about the focus funnel is it's intentionally, it's designed to be real dynamic, and allow for a to be very fluid that you can apply it perpetually on any second of every every day, um, because we live in this world of perpetual reprioritization where there are, based on what comes into our inbox or what we see on Twitter or what we read online, thing, our priorities can shift uh, you know, in a second, and then a second later, they shift again. Um, so a lot of people struggle with, a, a, a lot of people struggle with all of them. Uh, eliminate is probably the one that m- I think almost everybody struggles with. It's one, it's, it's one of the ones that I struggled the most with. And eliminate is the one, Brett, where we have by far the widest swath of opportunity, if you will, for immediate improvement. Because if we eliminate something today, it cr- we create more time tomorrow. By saying no to something today that we would be doing tomorrow, we have multiplied our time because now tomorrow we have space, uh, we have margin where we would have been doing something. Well, for me, I have a hard time saying no to people. Really? Yeah. I mean, I'm a people pleaser. I'm, I just I just am. Um, and so what ends up happening is I just kind of go through life without ever trying to say no. Well, one of the multipliers basically set me straight and he was like, Rory, that's stupid. Uh, you, it's impossible to go through life without ever saying no. You have to realize that anytime you say yes to one thing, you are simultaneously saying no to an infinite number of others. And... That was a big deal because I I started to realize that for me, if I am not consciously saying no to the things that do not matter, then I find that I almost always end up unconsciously saying no to the things that really do matter. And inside of that realization, I then develop the permit, the first permission, which is the permission to ignore and, and the permission to say no to the things that don't matter. So I can say yes to the things that do. And most of our inbox is like, we could just go through it and just delete and eliminate. And there's things on our calendar that we could just stop doing. And we don't know anybody an explanation, but, but we have a hard time emotionally doing that, which is another one of the bis- big misconceptions is that most of us think of time management. It's always logical tips and tricks, tools and technology, calendars and checklists. But time management today is no longer logical. It's emotional. So do you have any advice on, I guess, ma- managing the emotions of saying no? I mean, do you have like scripts that you can, people can use who have a hard time doing that? I mean, what, what can they do to take the sting off? Besides understanding that if they, if they say yes or saying no to something else, but once they have to actually do it, like what, anything there? I would just say, you ask yourself, if I do this activity, what will I what will I have to say no to, or what will I end up saying no to by saying yes to this? Uh, it's just kind of this this checkpoint. Um, so I think that's one that's one big idea. The other thing to realize is you can say no and still be nice. And and if you become an expert at nicely saying no, it's like you can you can say no and you can still be gracious about it. And and maybe you have to turn down someone's request. Like um, y- you know, we get a lot of requests to go speaking, um, and you know, my speaking fee is whatever it is. And a lot of times people will request, and and maybe they don't have my speaking fee. And it's such a bummer because it's like, man, you know, here's somebody reaching out to us. They really want us to come. It's such a compliment to be invited. But it's just like at this at this point in the career, I, I can't say yes to being doing that because then it's pulling me away from the other things that I'm doing. And it, it's not empirically like worth the time. And so um, what we figured out is we said, uh, well, we learned this from somebody, is that 
we will send uh, anybody that we have to say no to, we will often send them like a little gift package of just little books and video courses and things like that. And it's just like, so sorry we couldn't come, uh, but hey, here's here's a thing. Or what we uh, learned to do is now we do like virtual keynotes. Like, so we'll do it via webinar, like uh, where they can see my face and I'll present live to a live audience. But instead of having to get on a plane and travel and go do that, I'm able to do it from my office. So it really is less time out of, out of my, you know, entire schedule. Yeah. You know, something else that helps me, I love those ideas. I'm going to start putting those in practice. Something else that helps me when I have to say no to someone is to remind myself that when I ask someone like if they could do something, I'm always expecting no for an answer. Like I, I'm not, mm. you know, it's like, when I ask, I'm not expecting them to say yes. I'm like, okay, they could say no. Like, and if they said no, like, okay. And so it's just like, I imagine the other person, when I when someone's asking me to do something or asking a favor, they're asking with the, the idea that, well, he could say no too, you know? It's like, I don't get that upset when people say no to me. So maybe other people, I don't know. That's a really good point, Brett. I think that's really good. I've never thought about that, but it's like, Sometimes it's harder for the person saying no than for the person receiving the no, and we make it we make it a big deal. To but I, I feel the same way. It's like if I'm reaching out to somebody as a favor, it, it's like you, you know I, 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 a no is a possibility, and it's 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 not a bad thing. But yeah, if it happens, okay, no big deal. I I, I have a contingency plan for that. Right. Well, man, this is great stuff. Um, I, we could probably keep talking forever, but I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go. Um, but where can before we go, where can people learn more about your work? I would say, I honestly, I would say the best thing you could do is invest one hour. Uh, we put together a free one hour webinar. Uh, it's at procrastinateonpurpose.com, and if you if you just go to procrastinateonpurpose.com. You can register and watch this free one-hour training where I walk you through the whole focus funnel. You see it. We talk about the relationship to take the stairs. You can really kind of get your hands around it. And I promise if you invest that one hour with me, you will get thousands of hours back as a result of the shift that happens in your thinking. Um, and then from there, there's links to my blog and podcast and you know all my Twitter and all my other stuff. But just go to procrastinateonpurpose.com. Check out the free webinar and, and start there. Awesome. Well, Rory Vaden, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Oh, Brett, it's, it's, it's my pleasure, man. And you do such a good thing. I'm so glad that you said yes to having me. And uh, the last thing I would just leave everybody with is, you know, remember, no matter who you are, no matter who you were yesterday, for all of us, success is never owned. It's only rented. And the rent is due every day. Thanks, Rory. Our guest today was Rory Vaden. He's the author of the book, Procrastinated on Purpose, as well as Take the Stairs. For more information about his work, check out RoryVaden.com. And for those free tools uh, that he talked about on Procrastinate on Purpose, go to ProcrastinateOnPurpose.com. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And if you enjoy the show and you feel like you're getting something out of it, I'd really appreciate it if you give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is you use to listen to the podcast that will help get the word out about the show. So again, I thank you if you do that. And until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly. Stay manly.